Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Let's Draw. This is Feng Zhu speaking and we are on episode 74, Final Fantasy 7 Part 2. Um, so let's jump right in. So as promised, we're back after one week of break and also because I've received uh, so many messages in my inbox about uh, Fan, you're so lazy, where's the next episode? So here I am, uh, you know, and thanks for those messages. Very uh, encouraging for me to get this thing done. Um, so before we get to the chit chat, let's talk about what we're doing here. So last week, we left off with the nine thumbnails uh, what are these comps and now I'm going in to pick my favorite ones uh, in this case there's no art directors so I'm just going to pick whatever I like versus having a client pick it and uh, these are the three I chose uh, first thing I've done is copy and paste it into a new canvas and re-rest those images up to 5,000 pixels wide um, they started out as 2,000 as a comp which is plenty and 5,000 for a pitch painting should be enough and 5,000 pixels wide is also uh, I think just at the barrier in which your computer is no matter if you have a slow or fast computer it's a nice safe size because you start to go to 8,000, 6,000, you know, or 9 or 10K, uh, you start to deal with RAM issues just in case your computer is a little slow. All right, so I, I started with Cosmo Canyon because this is probably the easiest one. And this is advice I'll give you guys as well. Uh, when you have something that's difficult, for example, you have a level one, level two, level three difficulty, I tend to start with the easier one. The reason for that is because it allows the ease into the painting, kind of the settle in, warm up. And because it's the easier painting, you're not as nervous because if you start with something really, really tough, the problem I ran into in the past is that because it's hard, you could screw it up. And when you screw something up very early during the day, your morale could take a huge, huge hit. So in this case, I start with something easy, the likelihood of messing it up may be a little lighter. And that way you can produce something that you like within a very short amount of time and your morale stays very, very high. And when your morale is high, you can continue working forward. So Cosmo Candy in, my, in this case is I think the easiest of the three. It's almost all organic. Uh, no man-made structures is pretty much just painting little domes. Um, so it's quite easy. So um, yeah, that's what I decided to start with. And then the second one I'll work on is gonna be Rocket Town. Uh, because it's somewhat 50% organic. You got some buildings here and there, but overall it's a little bit easier. And the hardest one is Midgard because that is a complete 100% man-made structure. That means perspective, uh, your, your um, camera, all these kind of things have to be quite uh, precise. Otherwise, something will look kind of wonky versus a organic environment like Calisman Canyon will be easier to control. So before I get into textures, the first thing I do is just painting the secondary level details. What I use textures for, or photo plates, is to get the last level of density that photos are so good at because it saves a ton of time. We don't really need to go in there and paint every grain of the, of the rocks or every blade of grass. We can use photos for that because remember, at the end of the day, we're here to pitch an idea. The technique is something that clients really doesn't care too much about. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't think I've ever worked with a client that says you must paint this 100% by hand. Uh, they don't. They could care less if you use photo textures or not. So what I want to do is I want to get my painting about 60% there with completely um, hand done. And then the rest of the 30, 40 percent is going to be filled in with photo plates. Um, uh, I kind of skipped ahead a little bit here. Also, you noticed when I first started Cosmic Canyon, I dropped in a couple perspective lines. Those are pretty important because that established the camera. So you make you make sure that the grain of the of the canyons, for example, are running towards perspective that they're vanishing towards a horizon line because there can only be one horizon in a shot like this. Um, so those are early established. Now, when I'm painting, I'm kind of aware of the camera. Uh, and the focal distance that I have with that lens. Um, and now, again, just going in and painting these uh, secondary things. So this is quite fun because with, with comps, your confidence is really pretty high, right? I, and I mentioned this last week. When you're working in the blind or painting in the blind, I think for a professional, it's controllable. It's quite fun. But for a student who's learning, painting in the blind because sometimes be dangerous because you could get half an hour, an hour, two hours into it, and you get stuck. With a comp, we always have control and also if I screw this up we can always go back and start again right with it with the original comp so all right here we go with the uh, photo textures I just grabbed some rocks just to throw it in there to see what it looks like this one did not work well so I used it for uh, you know a few minutes and I decided to ditch it because the I think the cut in the rocks doesn't fit the language I want and that's something I also want to talk about in this episode which is design language for Cosmo Canyon we want this wonder uh, kind of this feeling of it's got a romance, it's got nature, it's got mystery, it's got this kind of awe-inspiring type of feeling I want to convey to my audience. So the shapes I want was rounded, curvy forms, very like cos Cosmo spinning, right? Because when I think of the Cosmos, I think of those spinning galaxies. So I want to have that kind of motif 
in my design language. The first rock I chose was too angular. It had these 90 degree kind of cuts in it. So the secondary rock you chose, uh, I chose here, you can see that it's more bit rounded, it's more, more organic, and it wraps better around the dome shapes I've established. And here I also used the warp tool from Photoshop to kind of just round out these textures a bit. And you can see how quickly this adds third level of detail without me spending you know, hours and hours painting rock textures, which really isn't our job. Our job here is to describe a, a scene, to describe a location, to describe the materials. Of course, we could sit down for 10 hours and paint every grain in the rock, but in production, especially with limited time, uh, photo saves a ton, a ton of uh, 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 cut down or cut down a lot of the production time. So nothing wrong with that. So um, later I'll give you guys some... Uh, reference uh, I think uh, websites for you could grab these as well so there's tons of them out there so uh, I'll give you my favorite ones uh, a little bit later so here I'm just kind of throwing a bunch of different textures and uh, yeah very very effective it's fast and this is because the underlying painting has been defined uh, I generally don't do too much photo bashing um, depend on the project but usually I always have some kind of uh, underlying painting or some kind of idea before I start with photo textures. Otherwise, photo bashing will get you in trouble as well, right? Nothing wrong with that technique, just de depends on what you are uh, using it for, so. All right, so here I'm drawing a river. I wanna get some green in there. I think the, uh, it's, it felt too red, you know? Uh, this is a purple and orange color palette, but I just wanna throw in a little bit more natural colors in there. The, the green, I think, helps with that, and green also works quite well with the yellow and purples. So I decided to just throw some grass into the base part of this, um, this design, yeah, to kind of bring your eye to that uh, observatory station in the middle of the frame. So, this was a fun one because I I love the banding from the textures I used. Uh, those those kind of yellow stripes that's going across the canyon. Later, you'll see me light these up from below, and I think it takes on a quite uh, a nice mysterious uh, feel to it. This texture here is for the close-up uh, rock that's next to our camera. So hopefully you guys also follow along and maybe did some comps as well and you could give this a try and you'll find that at least for some of you guys having comps is just such a nice boost in the morale that when you start these you're kind of really like halfway there. And you see this episode we're trying to do details right you see there's no secret there's no like there's a secret uh, or a mysterious part that I skip it's just this it's just adding textures paint a little bit add some textures paint a little bit and it just after about two three hours you get the painting way more detail than we started off with here's the value check again uh, with the black and white layer set on saturation here I'm balancing out the values once more with multiply to make it dark and using perspective or atmosphere perspective to line stuff up in the distance. So here I wanted the uh, tower to be a little bit darker than the background so it pops out as a nice strong silhouette or the observatory. So you just kind of lasso that in, blast it with a little bit of multiply and boom there you go. Hope I'm not speaking too fast on this episode. It's always rush for time. It's actually Monday night at 8.30 that I'm recording you guys, uh, for you guys because uh, the day is just super, super busy here. But uh, it's all good. You know, I love the comments you guys left. And uh, later we'll talk about the three games. Uh, I think I got my third game, but uh, I still got a few more minutes to think about it because I'm still not too sure. But uh, right here we are lighting up Cosmo Candy a little bit more, checking, flipping the canvas back and forth. Yeah. Right now, most of my textures are kept on a layer. I will collapse it later when I feel more confident, like, okay, this is the way this is going to go, then let's collapse the layers just to save some memory. Um, and also, it's just work a habit that uh, I don't work with layers too much. Uh, I think someone in the in the comment section asked about, do, do you know, what if clients have changes and you don't have anything on the layer? For me, it's always been faster to kind of paint it out than to have, say, 300 layers and everything, every single element is on a layer and you gotta go find it and change it out. I actually find it faster just to paint stuff out. Um, but again, it depends on the clients because if we're working with photo real plates, sometimes painting things in is extremely difficult. So having things on a layer is gonna help. But those are the kind of projects I typically don't, don't take on anymore. I like to take on these painterly type of things. And I, I communicate that pretty clearly with clients in the beginnings like, hey, look, I'm just gonna do early establishing very painterly looking stuff. Uh, if you're okay with that, then let's go, let's move forward. But uh, if you want something that's photo real, super, super uh, tight, I simply don't have the time to do it. Uh, you know, because that kind of stuff is very time, time consuming to manage all the layers and stuff. And right now I'm just not at the point of my career in which I find that interesting. 
right? So, but in the beginning of my career, we definitely did projects like that in which you're keeping about 40, 50 layers and every single rock and cloud and the people, you know, anything that's that's on top of one another is kept on a layer. That's just, just in case the clients have changes, so. But I personally don't enjoy that as a as a as an artist. I guess the artist side of me, the designer side of me, enjoys all of it. But the art side, I prefer something that's a little bit more uh, painted. <clears throat> all right. So you can see very very quickly in real time, these paintings took about two and a half hours each to bring to the level that you'll see at the end of the video. Um, so right now we're probably about an hour in without the textures, but quite relaxing. Listen to music and just uh, paint. You know, paint details. Now for students learning, I think the detail pass is still quite challenging because they're not sure uh, where to add it. Um, so here's some advice for that. Keep your, start your details in areas of focus. You don't want to detail the entire image because that's not how the human eye works anyways. When you are looking at a scene, your eyes focus on certain parts of elements. For example, if you're in your room right now, right? In front of you should be a computer, your keyboard. At one time, you're not looking at everything focused, you might notice some keys on your keyboard that are focused, like the F keys, right? The F1, F2, or maybe the mouse buttons is in focus. Maybe the corner of your Wacom tablet is in focus. Maybe the monitor is something in focus, but not everything at once. Your eye kind of bounces around from left to right uh, all over the place. So what you're seeing is snippets of elements in focus, and those elements are probably the things you want to look at anyways. For example, most of you guys are probably not looking at the monitor stand, right? What's holding up the monitor. You're probably not looking at the wires that's running from the monitor to the wall because we've been conditioned to know that those things are not that important in everyday life. The things you are focused on are the keys, your keyboard, the buttons, the power button, your monitor. Those are things we interact with. So when you're adding details, you also want to apply the similar philosophy. In this case, I want the Cosmo Canyon Observatory to have quite a bit of detail. I want the ground below it that leads to that to have some detail. I also want some of the rocks that's really close to camera to have some detail and I want to capture some of the clouds in the sky which I'm doing right now because after all this is Cosmo Canyon and I want the kind of the Cosmo the the Milky Way type of star patterns to show up in that corner so these areas get detailed the rest of the painting just let it go right um, notice the rocks to the left right now those canyons way in the distance it's still in the first rough phase in fact I leave it like that for quite a while because the you're not going to look there, right? Your, your eye is focused on the subject matter and the stuff back there, you feel it. And that's how we tell our students here as well. Like when you, uh, I think I talked about last week, right? On the last episode, like when I described the Amazon jungle, you feel trees, you feel river, you feel all these things, but you're not necessarily looking at every single detail. You're not looking at the leaves, you're not looking at the branches, but you will catch those once in a while. So what we want to do is control those points of interest for what you want the viewer to see. If we over detail this, actually the whole thing will start to die out. The painting, what we call it, uh, uh, the term we use is too stiff because the details are too perfect. Everything's in too much of a uh, attention, calling, everything's calling 100% attention. What happens is the painting actually becomes flat. And one of the terms we use here as well, we call that wallpapering because there's too much textures, too much details. They all fight uh, against each other. There's no more perspective, no more focal point, And the entire painting takes on this kind of wallpaper 2D feel. So. Yeah, and that's the advice I generally give to our students here for applying details. And just like I start with the three paintings in which you start with the easiest to the hardest, I do the same thing with applying details. So in this case, the easiest details are like things like grass, uh, little rocks, maybe some of the streams. These are so organic that if your brush is off by a few degrees, who cares, right? It looks, it looks, it looks fine. And then as you get to the observatory, the bottom ellipse, the the little uh, what do you call it, the lens, what the observer, the the, the tube, uh, what the lens fits into. Sorry, I forgot what the term that's called. Uh, the telescope, I guess. Yeah, the telescope. That you have to be painted a little bit tighter because uh, that's a man-made object, and if you make it too crappy, then it's very easy to spot that kind of mistake. So I'll fix that at the end. Right now, I'm just doing rocks and and cracks and these, these kind of things which are relatively easy to uh, control. You can see here now I'm controlling the bottom of the observatory and you got to slow that down a bit. And also adding some staircases, just kind of indication of life that there's uh, some, some activity or living uh, on, I guess, you know, human-like activity going on in there. Some fires and these kind of things. And adding more uh, green grass here and there. Do -do -do. I think uh, after this episode, I'll do, we've been doing JRPGs two 
episodes in a row actually three since this is a two-parter uh, so next one I, de I definitely want to do something else maybe i want to do a platformer game or something i'm not sure like do one of those 2d platformers which are making a huge comeback right now uh in the gaming scene so i thought about doing you know like blaster master or uh, like contra and some, some of these games already have hd remakes so I, i'm gonna avoid those but i think it'd be quite fun to do a side scroller game um in which we kind of approach it with a similar philosophy of is this going to be 2.5D, two, how can we make the, the graphics a little bit more interesting, the gameplay interesting uh, through design. So uh, here I'm working on the observatory, the tubes up there, and just being slowed it down a little bit, zoom in a little bit to make sure that uh, the object looks somewhat uh, controlled, so it's not super organic. Some balanced light since we're dealing with a cylinder shape. All this goes back to the basics of your four shapes, which is cube, sphere, cylinder, and cone. Uh, using those four shapes, you could pretty much make uh, probably 99.9% .9 of the objects in everything you paint. All right. So right now, I'm kind of just taking a look at Cosmo Canyon. It's starting to get there, and what I'll do is I'll move on to the other pieces, I think, pretty soon. All right, you don't want to spend the whole time on one piece. You want to keep your energy level up. Okay, so here I am, I think, I'm ready to get to Rocket Town. Here we go. So this is the second difficult piece because you have two buildings that are very prominent in the scene. So first thing I do, establish the perspective. Uh, drop that horizon line in there, drop some VP points, drop some uh, uh, VP1, VP2s, and just get those things going. Uh, you don't have to be perfect, right? At the end of the day, we're not here to do engineering 100% perfection. We're here to sell an idea. But if you're too sloppy, you, you just have bad art, right? If you're too perfect, Nothing wrong with it, but that could also consume a huge amount of time, and your painting might look stiff. Uh, it depends on what you're doing with it. So we want to be in a sweet spot for these kind of things. So, you know, some perspectives off here and there. Who cares? If the overall picture is looking pretty good, it has served its purpose. Uh, because if I went in here and model everything perfectly and done all that, maybe it's okay, but for early pitch, that could take you two days, and I don't think client's going to pay for that amount of time for early level or early phase pitching they generally give you a day to do like four or five of these paintings so using that process it's impossible to achieve um, so you got to strike a balance between how much perfection you want versus how much uh you know uh, time you want to devote into this kind of thing before you call it done so all right so let's talk about design of this uh, rocket town so i want everything to have a triangular uh language as we mentioned last week because i think that plays off the whole rocket thing going to going to space and going upwards so everything's pointing towards a center point so all the buildings here i changed it from the european kind of motif that you had in the original final fantasy 7 to a triangular form building now students have asked does it does it really is it really important to do that because are the players even going to pick that up my answer for that, no, actually, I don't think the player playing these kind of things go, oh, man, look at that. That design is, like, really thought out. It's got triangular because that is a meta uh, uh, metaphor for going up and going to the rocket. I doubt it. I think very, very small percent of the gamer population will actually care about that kind of backstory. So they ask, why do we even do it, right? It's like, okay, you're going to spend all this time going over the philosophy and the design language when the, only, like, 1% of the gamers actually pick it up. The reason for that is because it gives you a goal. See, when you're designing in the blind, what do you add? What do you do next? What kind of length, what kind of story are you trying to tell? When you have a philosophy, you kind of have a idea, a design direction to head in. For example, let's take Rocket Town, right? Because we have established everything is a triangular base and we want everything to have an overgrown green on the bottom and rust colors on the top, now we can apply that language throughout everything. For example, the windows, the tiles, the grass, the way the river works. Everything could take on this, everything goes from down to up philosophy. and Everything goes from green to reddish brown as we go up. So when you're adding detail, you don't have to second guess. You don't have to like, oh man, what do I do next? You know, you're twirling your fingers going, oh man, what, what part do I paint? And what do I add here? What do I add that? By having a common design language, you kind of already know what to do. It, the painting paints itself, as we say. But if I didn't have a philosophy or something to help myself as a designer control that, it, it could get a little bit more difficult because you're just guessing the whole time. It's like, okay, now I got to do a window. What window do I use? Now I got to do a, a river. This river flow this way, that way. And right now you can see my river flows in a triangular pattern towards the rocket in, in an upwards angle. It goes down, down, down. But it, ha it has these kind of step things. Um, same with all the staircase. Everything goes from down to up, down to up. Because that's the overall philosophy here, that we go from the lower ground to a higher level. And that's all established with a very 
simple uh, design language, which is a triangle, right, going down to up. So, and that's why we do it. it. It just gives you this philosophy. And later when we get to Midgar, uh, I'll mention that language as well. And it was extremely helpful for me when I was painting details of what, how to handle Midgar's architecture. Um, and uh, yeah, once we get to that, I'll mention that. So, all right. So here right now, just doing the same thing as uh, Cosmo Canyon, adding the, um, the secondary foundation forms correcting some of the geometry before we adding all the uh, photo textures, balancing things out. So this is a fun piece. I, I really like uh, the color palettes in these pieces, you know, nice, nice bright days, avoid the kind of brown and gray tone that sometimes dominates, I think too many video games out there right now. The uh, kind of, the, you know, they call it the brown uh, palette. Uh, it's nice to see some green, nice colorful stuff come out these days. Uh, like for example, like the next Dragon Age game looks quite pretty. You know, the color palettes are nice and rich. So I, I personally like that kind of stuff a lot. It just uh, it feels fun. It feels it feels fantasy. You know, uh, when there's too much brown stuff going on, it, it kind of makes the whole game feel muddy in a way. Like when you walk away from it, you don't have this nice uh, blue sky, open feeling about it. So, All right. Anyways, back to the black and white, balancing out the values. Yeah. This is fun, and you guys, please give me some more suggestions. I, I actually, I don't know if I'm gonna do a 2D platformer, but uh, yeah, continue listening to this kind of stuff in the YouTube channel. Uh, I might also add a Q&A for the next episode if I have time to fit that in, since there's been a bunch of questions since we've done the last Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna get to that as well. All right, time for textures. So going in and looking for, I think for this one, I wanted um, a few things. I wanted some grass to uh, look natural in the foreground. And then I wanted some rusty parts to signal that this was a abandoned uh, 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 launch base right, for the rockets. And again, playing up the philosophy of uh, they used to be new, everything new, the hope was very high, right, we're going to space and all that, and now everything's kind of abandoned, it's left over. That dream is still there, but it's not perfect. The rocket is no longer uh, pointing 100%, uh, 90 degree up, it's not at an angle, and the Earth, what the planet has reclaimed much of its uh, 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 human-made stuff back to nature. And whatever is man-made has this kind of rusty red. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of textures, what I do here is the most common layer that I put them on are mult not, not multiply, overlay, soft, I think it's called soft light, I believe. I'm sorry, I can't remember, man. It's like the one after hard light, I think. I don't even look at it because I use the, uh, the, the keyboard to control the setting. But I think it's called soft soft light or hard light, something like that. But it's the one with soft in it. Uh, I always use lighten. Lighten is a pretty good one. Multiply depending on what I'm using it for, but I don't use it too much. But uh, the most yeah, most common is I think soft light is the one that's called. Most of these right now are being applied on soft light because when you use something like overlay, it's a little harsh. When you use overlay, it's still good, but what it'll do is it'll start affecting your values. You'll make your lighting areas or areas that are light value into a slightly darker value. So you can still use overlay, but you have to then check your values. Right? Turn the black and white layer on and check that to make sure that the texture is not overly dark. Uh, lighten has the opposite effect. Lighten obviously makes things lighter, uh, but that could be very helpful for picking up highlights, picking up uh, little grains and these kind of things, quite useful. So here I'm trying to apply a little bit of the forest texture, some of the overgrowth. And you'll notice sometimes I keep very, very little of the texture I throw in there, right? You could put in a picture and they end up erasing like 90% of it. But who cares? That works, right? We're, we're not here to like force something into it. And I want to stress that point, which is when you're using photo plates, you don't need to force anything into these. Don't let the photo drive your painting. Let your painting drive the photo. Um, we ran into this in, with our students here sometimes that they'll spend like half an hour or an hour looking for like the perfect image in the right perspective to fit in the image uh, into your painting. And at the end of the day, you might not even done that much, even though they wasted, you know, a whole hour looking for like a car to, to perfectly fit on the freeway. Granted, if you have that kind of time schedule in your production pipeline, no problem. But in a fast turnaround time, that could be efforts that could be used somewhere else, right? You could just hand paint the car, you know, in an hour's time or, you know, uh, change it up a bit so you don't have to exactly use the one that has to match the road. So these are things you, you balance out according to the schedule you have. So in this case, because of our underlying painting, the photo, the exact photos don't have to match in perfect perspective to my painting at all. All they serve are textures. So in this way, I'm constantly controlling the painting or controlling the photos with my painting and not the other way around, right? We're forcing forcing perspective to go in. 
Uh, sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you get these lucky accidents, which the perspective work perfectly with your painting. And then those are the cases in which like, hey, that's cool, you know, uh, happy accident. But oftentimes I don't plan it too much in terms of uh, uh, matching the photo to the painting. So, but if you work on a photo real piece in which you know everything has to be perfect, then you have to match photo to plate. Uh, cases like that takes longer. So maybe one of these days we'll do one of those paintings, but uh, they're very, very time consuming because you have to have all your flow, photo plates prepared. Uh, like say you're doing a game like the, um, like the Last of Us or something like that, in which you're taking place in a real city. Then you have to look for cars, uh, trees, uh, you know, stuff on the, on, the, on the streets, like lamp posts, trash cans, and uh, paper and all that kind of stuff. All that needs to be in the proper perspective and proper density. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So I, I might do an episode on that in a while. So. So this one throwing all the photos and you can see by throwing all these photos on it never changed the main goal of this painting and that's sometimes important if your clients approve this comp from the uh, from last week's little nine little paintings and they approved it then you kind of have to turn it in sort of like what you turn what you show them as a comp do you know what i'm saying because you can't be like okay i approved this comp you come back with this dark red lava world with like steam everywhere and it's all evil looking they're like dude what happened man i thought we picked the green happy world how can we turn into this crazy lava looking thing so you have to kind of respect the original comp and uh don't alter it too much you know you definitely want to add to it and like for example this one i add a little bit more of the uh, the stream has a little bit of rust colors in it i i love that because he kind of totally plays up the story I want to sell, which is the 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 nature with human things kind of joined together and that color in the river that it produced. You can see on the bottom center there with the blue and the red, uh, that fits perfectly with the blue and the red right now I'm working on, on the roof side, right? So all these colors are joined together and that wasn't in the original comp. That was a happy accident from the photo texture we threw in. So those are things that, uh, you know, the photo is definitely adding more to what I have prepared, but it's not changing the comp so much so that a client's like, hey man, we don't uh, we don't like the changes you made here. So, but you never know. You could be a client that's like, dude, that river sucks, man. Put it back to uh, to white water on green grass or something like that. So, here adding the uh, the leftover parts. I need to take a drink of water. Holy crap! Talking for twenty six minutes without a single water. Hold on one second, guys. All right, sorry about that. Back to this. Yeah, this this was fun. This you know, I I came in on uh, actually I came in on Sunday to record the painting itself. I'm just doing the audio now. It was quite relaxing. Again, this is one of those games that just brings a lot of nostalgia to to myself. Uh, loved this when I was a kid, and to kind of paint back to something I used to play, you know, 17 years ago is quite uh, quite fun. All right, more textures. All right, so the third game, right? Let's talk about that real quick. Um, man, it was a tough choice because I noticed a lot of you guys list the Pokemon uh, as one of the games. I actually did not play that game too much, although I heard a lot of good things about it. I think you guys are talking about the Game Boy version, maybe? Um, I actually had it, but I just never got into it. Um, but I think that's one of those games I could play forever. The other one that will last forever, which is not actually one of my choices, is that Japanese game called, is it? Deskaya? I don't know if I pronounced it right. Um, it's a, there's the one, the little vampire boy. Uh, quite quite funny looking, top-down isometric uh, turn-based battle. That's the game in which you could level like your equipment like a thousand times or some, something ridiculous like that. Like every single equipment could be leveled to level 999. So if you do the math on that, you could pretty much play that game for uh, for your entire lifetime, I think. Um, but I think to play that forever, I don't know. I don't think I could play that game forever because it does get pretty repetitive. So... For me, I think the third choice is going to come down to one of those Total War games. And I think it's going to have to be Total War Medieval. That's actually not one of the popular ones they make. I think Rome, uh, the original Rome is one of the most popular ones. I think the recent one uh, debates out on that one, if that's the most popular one. Uh, Shogun is pretty good, but my favorite is actually Medieval. Uh, I just like that time period. I like the uh, you know the whole uh, European expansion with Venice and the whole uh, Mongolians coming in from the east. I find that time period to be very fascinating, the whole crusades and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's one of those games. It's actually quite similar to Civilization, um, but it's got the battle thing going on in it as well. So I think that would probably be my third choice of a game that I could probably play for the next um, 20 years and not get bored. I'm, I'm actually playing that game today. You know, it, That game came out a while back, and it's still as addictive as ever. So you're painting some clouds. And since I mentioned Civ, I actually went back on the weekend, I think Friday night, I loaded up Civ 5. I haven't played that game for a long time. And as soon as you pick it up, you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to test this out real quick. And then you look at the clock and two hours just flew by. You know, I'm sure for those who play this game, you know what I'm talking about. That game just makes the time completely disappear. And you made like five moves and it's already been like three hours, you know. So it's crazy. Great game. Uh, one of those games that you just 
get lost in for the entire day and uh and really for someone who's watching you play they're like what the heck are you playing to you looking at a bunch of tiles with some icons on it and you took you 19 hours to put more icons on the board but uh, unless you play it i think from an outside perspective you just can't understand why games like that are are so popular right because nothing changes on the screen You're just looking at green tiles with the some little little icons with numbers on it and then you but you spend hours and hours doing that so the the, the entertainment is in your head you know so um all right so i'm dropping in more of my tree branch or the tree brush that i use all the time since rocket town in the original final fantasy 7 was in kind of a foresty place i still have no idea how they launched this rocket without destroying the town you know the blast from that but it is a magical world so maybe they cast some uh Oh, what do they call it? What do they call magic in this world? Magica or something? Or Magi? Magi? Something like that, right? Some, uh, so maybe they cast some kind of shield around the town so the rocket blast don't uh, obliterate the entire town next to it. So. Right, bounce some trees out. Right now, I, I haven't even painted yet. There's always been, there's still just photo textures, atmosphere perspective, and some photo brushes to go in there. But it's really looking a lot more cleaned up than um, than we started with the comp. Yeah. And you guys could grab all the high-res versions from my blog. I should put it there after the show. Yep, I'll put upload these to my blog at 2,000 pixels wide. So, um, yeah, just in case you want to see what they look like. Because Design Cinema or YouTube always make these a little bit darker than they are. They're actually a little bit lighter if you download the original JPEGs. All right, time to hit the toughest one, Midgar. Then I'm kind of just looking back to see what I've done. All right, here's Midgar. So even when I'm doing these final paintings, you notice that I... Um, keep all three of these paintings open so this way I could kind of go back and forth to correct things. So Midgar, let's talk about Midgar's design philosophy. So this one, I had some trouble in the beginning. It's like, man, what do I do for architecture? And you'll see this one actually undergoes some of the most dramatic changes, especially on the left side of the screen. I'll add an entire column in there. When I started, I kind of want to do a little bit of uh, Art Nouveau architecture. The original one had a little bit of this uh, old European, some Paris looking architecture, you know, from the 1600s. Um, I started with that, but I just felt that the language wasn't strong enough. And also, that language has been used a lot. I mean, I mean a lot nowadays by games. Um, for example, you look at um, the game Remember Me. Um, that's a neo Paris that had a little bit of that kind of feeling to it, right? Kind of junky Paris architecture, Art Nouveau, mixed with technology and wires. Um, uh, Gears of War has some of these philosophy. I actually worked on Gears of War back in 2000. Man, what year was that? 2001, right? I worked on Gears, and Gears had that, um, the original Gears of War, uh, also had that language. And there's a couple other games that use this kind of French uh, 1600 period mix with technology. So I decided to go with a different philosophy for Midgar, and I really start to think about what Midgar stands for. And let's, let's discuss that, right? Midgar is the center of this part of the world, and it is sucking the life off the planet. Uh, what they call materia or something, right? They're, they're sucking this energy out from the planet, therefore destroying the planet in the process. So what I want to do is design a mechanical uh, blood vessel, I guess is the better way to put it, right? For humans, we have these vessels that come from your heart and go out to the rest of your body, and the heart provides fresh blood. In this case, we're doing a similar design, except the blood is being sucked out by this giant machine, which is the city itself. So for the design language, I try to put Midgar as this um, as, a, as a mechanical heart and what it does is just instead of uh, pumping out blood it's sucking away the life force so everything becomes these artificial veins and everything goes from the ground and up into the city and that is the design's philosophy so later you'll see me putting these kind of wiry kind of pipes running everywhere from the ground up using these huge columns and just sucking all the life out and we play with the colors as well so the life is still near the ground this kind of reddish brown uh, earthy colors, I guess, right? And that's on the lower one-third of the painting. As the life force goes up and up into the city, I want to kill that color off. I want to say, like, now it's becoming mechanical, it's becoming human, it's becoming cold. So all colors get erased as we go higher up on the color, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, altitude. And you'll see that already happening here, in which we have browns on the lower part of the painting, and we're going to this kind of desaturated kind of a cool gray as we go up higher into the city. And this will play with the philosophy. So this goes back to the, you know, why have philosophy? Well, this helps you design because as you start painting details, you like you know exactly what to do. In fact, now you can add the entire philosophy into everything into Midgard, even car designs, costuming, um, props, 
uh, all these things could take on a similar language. And it's very helpful for designer to, to have this in your brain when you're designing. Even though, like I said earlier, maybe 1% of the audience plays this game and go, oh man, I think there's a design motif here uh, with, with a deeper meaning for this. But even if they don't, who cares, right? It helps you establish a new language. It also helps you to add details and uh, all sorts of props without thinking too hard on what to do. Okay, so, and that's, that's how Midgard uh, came together here. Also try to make it a little bit wetter on the ground. You can see here some reflection because water and life are connected together. Um, for those who watch the movie, what's that movie called? Uh, Fight Club, right? Fight Club. Uh, you should go back and watch that brilliant, brilliant movie in which every time you see water, you will run into blood or fights because the director has a similar uh, philosophy because the two are mixed together. So in this case, we have life on the bottom of Midgard. So I decided to wet that down to signal life. And as you go up higher, the reflections, the wetness goes away and goes into this very cold, dry, no life type of uh, design. So this is the starting phase in which I started with the Paris type of motif, as you can see here. And later uh, I get, got rid of it because I just felt like the design wasn't strong enough. It's like, man, I've seen this before. You know, I've seen this Neo Paris with pipes and stuff like that. How can we change it up a bit? Yeah. Especially in this early pitch. Maybe the clients will hate this, right? Then you go back to the whole Neo Paris thing. But uh, you could pitch this idea and you can, in fact, along with the idea, pitch the story that I just told you guys, the whole philosophy of sucking life out of the earth. And you know, I shouldn't say earth, this is uh, the planet, right? Sucking from the planet and into Midgar. The clients might actually like the idea, they might not like the execution, right? And that might sound weird, They're like, okay, they paid you to do these paintings, but they don't, they don't like the painting, but they might like that idea. And what they could do is like, hey, you know what? The idea is pretty good, but maybe you did not execute it to how you described it but at least that keeps the production going forward the production has not stopped the production has not gone backwards it's still moving forward and if the production is moving forward you are doing your job as a designer so in this case they might not like this painting but they like the philosophy we'll take a round two or we'll do another round of comps maybe try some other ways to signal how the planet could be sucking or how Midgar could be sucking life out of the planet and try for other passes and see where that takes us all right so what I was going to talk about before, I was going to talk about more gamey stuff, but uh, yeah, let's get back to this. <clears throat> so adding textures. Okay, let's talk about the um, the websites. I forgot about that. The websites I get these from. Um, I'll see if I can write these in the descriptions. YouTube is pretty picky about putting hyperlinks, but uh, one of the places I go a lot is called Corbis.com. That is spelled C-O-R-B-I-S, right? Let me say Corbis, yes. C-O-R-B-I-S.com. And it is a stock photography website. Uh, it's my favorite one. And if you register, it's, it's free to register. And you basically have resources to a ton of reference images. And they're very small. They're only about 500 pixels wide or so. Very tiny. Uh, but they give you enough information. They give you enough for reference. It's kind of like having millions of photos at your disposal. So yeah, Corbis is very good. The other one that's very similar to Corbis will be ImageBank. So that's image as the image and bank, one word, imagebank.com. Uh, very similar, also stock photography kind of website. And so this website gives you just access to millions and millions of photos. Uh, maybe not millions, but pretty close, I think. Um, then in terms of technical detail, I go to a website called airliners.net. So that's air, airliners, like A-I-R-L-I-N-E-R. S dot net. So airliners.net has about 2 million photos of high, high resolution photos of anything to do with airplanes. And since I like airplanes, I get all my details and parts and these kind of things from, from planes. So, and just because they're airplane doesn't mean you can use it somewhere else, right? It's completely just detail, just Ghibli stuff, you know, wires and engine parts, runways, uh, all sorts of stuff, control panels and these kind of things. So airliners.net with 2 million photos, you're not going to be able to download all of them. So, and all the photos are high quality. They have a very rigid um, submission scheme in which, you know, it's all submitted by amateurs, professionals, and anyone can submit. But who makes it or who has their photo accepted, their, their tolerance for quality is very, very high. So everything you get at airliners.net is very high quality, right? So you're not going to get uh, bad photos. So yeah, so I go to those. Um, and then the rest is just Tumblr. Tumblr is great for this kind of stuff. Just type uh, in your Google search, Tumblr space, whatever you're looking for, and you'll find a ton of images on that. And if you find good Tumblr, save them. I save all the images because as a designer, start collecting reference images. They're very, very important. One, for understanding the world, and two, do what I'm doing here, which is texture usage, right? Get the density. So 
that is one which I talked about before. It's one of the few things I don't trade often with my designer friends, right? I trade brush, no problem, uh, because it's default anyways. Um, perspective grid, certain tools, who cares? But in terms of reference, I generally don't share too much of it. You know, some of the generic stuff, no problem. But sometimes you have these really, really rare references. So if I'm working with a guy in a team, I don't mind sharing that, but in terms of like, hey man, like, you know, put all your reference on a folder somewhere, it's like, no, go find your own references. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like everyone has their own uh, philosophy of what they like, and also references give designers a little bit of edge up in terms of uh, some of the unique stuff they can have in fo for photos. So, but be careful, as always, don't use other people's, if you're going to do a photo plate, I've mentioned this many, many times, if the end result has a huge percent of the photos left, don't use that photo. If you're going to use it for textures, not that big of a deal because the context has been changed completely. The original photo has been destroyed in the process. The only thing you used it is for some density and you paint on top. But if you're going to use the photo and you know 80% of it is still the original author's photo, then you have to use your own photos uh, where used photos are copyright free. Otherwise, you're, you're using somebody else's perspective, somebody else's composition. They, they, they don't belong to you, right? The photographer did that for you. So avoid that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you could get into problems uh, with the photographer. In this case, you're using textures. The photo has nothing to do with Midgar. Do you know what I'm saying? There's, there's nothing here that, that gave me Midgar. It's all just textures. So here I'm still throwing in some uh, some windows and these kind of things, and then pretty soon you'll see me throw the um, the blood vessel philosophy or design language into Midgar. Do, 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 do. Yeah, hopefully I could get next school starts again next week, so I'll be back teaching again. Uh, yeah, starting next uh, next Monday, but I still try to keep the design cinema going. Um, these things are taking a little longer now since we are. Uh, you know, we've got to improve the quality as we go. So these things are actually taking about a whole day to produce, uh, plus another few hours to, you know, edit and render and all that kind of stuff. Um, but definitely, uh, you guys are super awesome. The the feedback has been great. So, you know, I love the fact that some of you guys are being inspired from these videos to have your whole career changed and stuff. So that that's extremely rewarding uh, for me. Even if one person, right, if you change one person to... to to, to you know make their life happier then it's all worth it for for us here producing these so uh, no worries it's just more time thing that we, it's not like I don't want to produce these for you guys it's just it's really time consuming to do these but uh, yeah keep, keep those comments going because that does give us uh, you know nice morale boost of like man you know we're helping somebody and uh, we're sharing and helping people that is the best reward that you could possibly have and I encourage you guys out there as well if you want to feel good as an artist for yourself, share your knowledge. Doesn't matter even if you're amateur, even if you're not a professional. By by helping people out there, by talking to them, you know, and this kind of stuff makes you feel really, really good inside, and it also gives you a lot of confidence, right? Versus like, look at my work, I'm so awesome, I'm better than you. Maybe makes you feel better, but it's not gonna make the other guy feel better. The way to to build a mutual re relationship is to help someone else, you know, like, hey man, here's this technique I developed, check it out. You know, it's on YouTube, watch it. And if that person applies it, like, hey, that's great. That's really awesome. Glad I could help. You, you'd be surprised how much personal confidence it builds within yourself uh, that you're able to put a smile or uh, some confident boost in somebody else. So it gets addictive. You know, I've been teaching for, uh, what, 1999? So how many, 15 years. And the first time I stepped in a classroom, I felt this energy in which students, you're watching them paint, uh, you know, or draw, kind of uh, amateurish kind of stuff and after a few weeks they start changing their their design language start changing they start to become professional and you can see it in their in their uh, in their personalities that they get the confidence boost they're feeling happy about themselves and that rubs off on you right and if the whole class is doing that i mean it is a joy to teach so i encourage a lot of you guys out there to share as well you know so there's plenty of jobs to go around for everybody there's no need to hog this kind of stuff you know there's Especially nowadays, there's like so many game companies out there that uh, there's more jobs to reject and to take right now. You know, especially with E3 right now happening. I mean, there's so much freelance out there uh, for for concept artists that uh, yeah, there's no need to hoard everything or don't share secrets or anything like that. Give it all out. It's it's fine. Uh, plenty of stuff to go around. All right. So here's uh, okay. Back to the painting, right? So talking up about life stuff, but uh, yeah, I mean, the reason why I bring that up is because. It, you know, right now with the internet, it makes it so easy for everyone to talk to everybody else, to share 
materials with one another. Um, hopefully in the future, I'll be developing other tools for you guys to make that process easier. And of course, it's going to be all free uh, for you, all you guys out there as well. So we're working on it. We're working on these um, uh, things to help, especially student types uh, who maybe cannot afford a school and just learning at home. I want to build a set of tools for you guys so you could uh, learn along with us um, at your own pace and have you know you'll see right i don't want to reveal too much right now because i hate over marketing and then don't deliver it so when when it's ready i'll show it to you guys but uh, that's something we've been developing uh for quite a while now that i want to give out to you guys uh for free you know so all right let's go back to the uh back to the painting here now i'm starting to do the uh wiring pretty soon now so there's some vehicles here this painting took a while this is the longest painting of all three because we're not dealing with organic forms Everything has to be kind of proper in perspective. So you couldn't paint rocks and grass and these type of stuff. But at least it's still messy. Messy architecture or chaotic architecture is much easier to handle than, say, a uh, like a movie like Minority Report. That is a very difficult film to design for because everything is so clean, so posh. Um, you know, I think of Apple, right, designing like an Apple office. Um, that's tricky versus designing a post-apocalyptical zombie town, which is much, much easier because the tolerance for mistakes in this type of Midgar, crazy, chaotic, is much, much higher. You know, you can make mistakes here and there and it doesn't show up too well. So here yeah, I'm just doing the last minute uh, reflection to make the ground wet. So I kind of hinted at three different vehicles. You kind of have this train bus looking thing and a couple of cars. Give it some life, streets. I want... You know, the whole philosophy, like Mika, all the streets, all the people that live below are our life, right? As you go up, you don't see people anymore. You don't see civilization anymore. Everything's dead. But down below, you got like thousands of people walking around. They're flowing like, like red blood cells through the city. And they, you know, they're the one that's living. But the life gets sucked out of them as you go uh, higher up. All right, sorry. Let me take another drink real quick. Hope this episode is not rushing by too quick. I know I'm talking really, really fast. I just can't help it. Um, I need to take one of these episodes and just do a two or three hour episode, which is just totally chill, you know. And that's something I'm planning as well in the future with you guys, you know, some kind of live type of thing. I'm not sure what that is yet, uh, in which we could just talk normal. You guys got real time questions, and I'll answer them in real time without having to just rush through and just blow through at a thousand words a minute here. Um, so, for, for example, I think a lot of you guys have questions that uh, you could ask, uh, you know, with part one, part two, part three, right? Um, so it'll be much, it's much better than just a Q&A in which we answer part of the question. So all those things we're trying to build for you guys. So but it takes a lot of work, takes a lot of energy on our part. We have a pretty sizable team <laughs> working on that kind of stuff for you guys right now. Um, but when it's coming, hopefully it'll be cool, right? Okay, a little bit more building textures. You can see I'm having quite a bit of trouble, not trouble, but uh, time consuming, I guess, uh, on this piece, just to try to get the bigger pieces in play before I add the little tiny details. Don't forget the um, blur your vision, right? Blur your eye to see the, uh, all right. If you blur your vision on this piece, you see that it has a little bit of a rainy feel to it. Uh, it's very wet on the ground. Uh, you have a little bit of rain atmosphere where the central tower is located. And that's what I'm trying to go for. And this huge, cement-like man-made structures everywhere. All right, I think the first of the machine pipes are start to come in, in which we do the uh, the blood vessel flows and stuff like that. So for next episode, what should we do, man? Give me some suggestions. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier, I think Blaster Master or um, what was that game called? Um, well, Contra is pretty cool, but they've done a version already with Contra. Super Ghosts and Ghouls, I believe there's a HD version of that already. Already, um, I want to avoid the modern games. I think a lot of you guys are mentioning like games that just just came out. You know, like I want to avoid those because those are still very very active. I think when we do a HD or some kind of let's draw, we should pick games that are probably at least 10, 12 years old, so that we avoid anything that's that's just came out. You know. We want to make sure these are really, really a reboot with the original graphics than to uh, just enhance, you know, like a game like Half-Life, you know. Uh, even though it's quite old, it's still not, uh, they have Half-Life 2, and I think they're making 3 right now. So those are things we don't need to do uh, less draw for. Let's do some stuff that just hasn't been touched for a long time. Maybe we'll do like an arcade game or something. Maybe we could do something, we, we, we take a board game, you know, some kind of um, uh, paper and dice type of game and make that into a video game. I don't know. So we'll see. All right, so now I'm starting to paint the um, third level details, cleaning up the central tower because Midgar has this very iconic um, central point. He's got this kind of uh, cylinder uh, horizontally across a vertical piece. 
So that kind of identifies uh, Midgar. So you clean that part up. And it's got a central light lit core going up. And also install the Shinra logo, which has a diamond shaped red, very iconic form. I also applied that red diamond later into the Rocket Town as well to signal that both of these places are, uh, I guess, built by the corporation. Uh, here are some of the initial veins coming in, the blood vessels or man-made blood vessels. And by the way, thank you so much for all the um, Facebook messages. I got a ton last week, probably because I told you guys to tell me I'm lazy. So I got a bunch of those and also got a bunch just uh, thanking for the production. So I cannot reply to all you guys. It's just way too many of them. Um, but thank you so much for writing in and uh, I definitely appreciate it. And again, that stuff really helps uh, uh, us as a company to continue producing these uh, you know, for, for free for you guys. So, And don't worry, we'll never charge for these kind of things. So we get those requests as well from companies actually who want to package all these design cinemas into a some kind of like collection or something and sell them. But uh, we're like, no, 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 that, that defeats the whole purpose. The whole point of design cinema is to offer free free tutorials, right? Without, uh, you know, hopefully too much advertising. I hope I don't do it too much, right? I uh, want to keep it completely for you guys. This is a one-sided thing. It's... Uh, for those who want to get into this business, because I this you know I mentioned this well a few episodes back, but uh, I wanted something like this when I was younger, but there just wasn't any. I mean, I was digging everything, man, when I was like 17, 18 years old. Anything I could find about concept art, I would just buy. You know, even even the like for example, they'll have these books on, on films back in the days, like Gladiator or something like that. They only have like one chapter on concept art, right? The rest is like sound design, like film film or storyboarding and behind the scene photos, actors interviews, right? But there'll be like five pages of a hundred page book that has concept art. I'll buy it because that's that's five pages of information I could use. Uh, it's just so rare back in the VHS tape days, there was no behind the scenes of anything. You know, so I was just eating stuff up and no one to ask questions. There's nobody doing this kind of stuff. Uh, there's no, you know, Facebook and these kind of things. You couldn't reach anybody. So I want to build a resource for you guys out there to hopefully, and I'm just one of the guys, right? There's many, many different ways to do this kind of stuff. There's hundreds of concept guys, thousands of guys out there actually doing this, but I, hopefully I could play my part uh, and share some of this philosophy with you guys um, because yeah, that's something I wanted when I was younger, <clears throat> a place to, to, to see how it's done. Yeah, it's such a secretive. I think still is even today. It's still some of a, a secretive industry that uh, you know a lot of questions are not not asked or the industry don't share. And it's it's for a reason. This is a competitive business. Uh, you know your Ubisofts, your EAs, and Activisions, and everybody's competing with one another. So they usually don't want to give out too much of how stuff like this is getting done. Um, but uh, I think for younger guys learning, it's very important to see, you know, or at least get motivated. Motivation is the key here for why I do all this kind of stuff, right? To just to, to make you guys see, hey, there's a whole industry out there for, for concept art and entertainment. So um, perhaps, you know, every 1,000 people that watch this, maybe a, a one person decides to pursue this, right? And that's, that's the kind of stuff that uh, hopefully you'll make an impact. All right, here comes a Shinra logo. Just kind of taking a look at the reference. A red uh, triangle or a square rotated 90 degrees and with a white border. <clears throat> I guess see how iconic that is. Even though we don't have to put in the actual logo, the writing, the shape itself kind of sells that uh, uh, language. All right, painting some of the city scene. I love the stuff that's going on back there. A little bit miscellaneous, right? Not defining anything. Actually, entire this entire Midgard painting is kind of miscellaneous in a way. Uh, just too time consuming. But I love that rainy city feel right uh, blade runner obviously comes to mind for those who've seen blade runner but uh yeah like if, if you're in hong kong or shanghai uh, at nighttime after a light rain it's that that feeling is so magical you know maybe some of you guys experienced that before but yeah if you're in this busy like especially shanghai you're in the like uh, right where all the buildings are after it rains it's just all the lights are picking up the reflections in the rain. The mist is picking up all the neon lights everywhere. You feel like you're in, you're in you know in the future, man. It feels like Blade Runner. All right. So here I'm going back to Rocket Town to add the details where the painting on top of the photos. Right. So this is so the the way it worked was um, take the comps, res it up, add second level detail to hold the forms, photo textures set on mostly soft light. Then after all that is done, we go back and paint on top of those photo textures to blend the photo and the original painting together. So it's not so uh, jarring in between the photos, plates, and your paint. So now I'm going in with paint again to melt those elements together. 
And here's you do your third level details according to the uh, some of the stuff I talked about mentioned earlier, right? Focal points. What's important in Rocket Town is going to be the rocket, the home on the right now on the right side with the three three windows. So that's going to be a key point for your eye. Uh, the river will get some of that, and some of the close-up objects on the ground on the lower left corner will get some detail uh, attention as well. Later, I'll show you guys what these look like after about... I did pause the video or stop the video for about an hour for each painting, because otherwise, this will just go on for a very long time doing details. But you're seeing basically how details are applied. I didn't skip anything up to this point. And uh, yeah, so the only thing I skipped is about an hour of just doing this, like how, how I paint the sign, uh, and just... Go in there, slowing things down, and just paint, 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 paint. Yep. Doing the house, some green grass, right? Very overgrown, kind of this um, village in the middle of nowhere. All right, I got five minutes left. So, yeah, hopefully, um, but maybe send me some more, um, but give me some time, man. Give me like, uh, give me like these two, three weeks before the next one because uh, school's back in session and in the first week or so, it is pretty busy around here as we have a uh, bunch of new students again that we have to uh, train and get them into gear, into the work mode, I guess, is the best way to do it. And uh, it generally takes about two, three weeks to put our new students in the, uh, in the work mode. And then it be becomes a little bit more relaxing uh, for me. And also, I don't think I have too many freelance projects coming up uh, pretty much done or give them off to other people because no time to do it. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to do more design cinema. I'd rather do these actually than uh, client work because it's it's fun, you know, and also it's kind of controlled by, by us, you know, you guys and me, we could come up with these topics and we paint for each other. Uh, client stuff, oftentimes you work on these games and you can't even show it for like... Uh, for years, you know, I think we just recently came off a project, a very big one that you guys will probably hear about it in uh, probably 2016, <laughs> you know. So it's a big project, but you can't say anything about it. You can't even hint at it. You can't even say if it's sci-fi or fantasy or anything. You can't say a single thing on these kind of things for like two years, you know. Until the company gives you the right to say it, you just have to keep it quiet. Um, and projects like that could also die, you know. A year later, it'd be like, they canceled it. Um, and then all your drawings go into oblivion, you know, completely gone. Uh, because when a company cancels these projects, they can always tell you, we canceled it for now, but we might bring it back five years from now. So in the meantime, you cannot show anything you've done for this project because they're still under uh, non-disclosure and therefore you cannot talk about it. So uh, not as fun sometimes. You work on these projects just to, uh, you know, have disappear. But, uh, but if you're in an industry, you have to get used to that. This is not a show-off business. This is not an industry about you. You know, it's like, man, I want the whole world to see my concept art to say how awesome I am. Don't, if you're doing it for that reason, you're not going to enjoy this business. This is about making products. And if you're making a product that shipped, great. If you work on a product that didn't ship, chalk it up to a good learning experience that you, you know, did some cool paintings for it. But if your paintings never get seen by the audience, that's fine. Do you know what I'm saying? Because you picked up a skill in the process. But if you get all frustrated, like all angry because the game got canceled, you're not going to have a good time in this business because it happens probably 50% uh, of the time, you know, that your project might get canceled or killed or changed. Uh, and you have no control over such things because it's, unless you're paying for it and funding it yourself, uh, it's not your project. Clients could do whatever they want with these kind of things. So yeah, it's not a, it's not a show off business, right? If you're on Facebook, like counting how many likes you got on a painting or like you post it up and you want to, you want your comments to all come in, you're in the wrong business <laughs> for, for this kind of thing, you know? So um, this is a hidden business. We do it for, for ourselves, for, for bringing enjoyment for the paintings you do. Even if, even if nobody else out there see it and you're the only person who sees it, but you have fun doing it, then you'll enjoy this business. So if you want to get a lot of glory and a praise and all that kind of stuff, then I advise you not to be in this business. Um, it is not for showing off. All right. I mean, especially in the beginning when I got into this business in, what, 97? Nobody sees this stuff. You know, there's no internet, really. I mean, there was, but there's no there's no social sites whatsoever. Um, uh, and also, clients back in the days do not clear you for anything uh, because they're so secretive on this kind of stuff. So for years, you know, just, you could barely show, like, 20% of the work you do in this business. But it never bothered me because I have so much fun working on them that I could care less. All right, so here's the ones after about an hour that I skipped, what they look like. Um, again, you guys could go to my blog, which is, uh, what the heck is it? Um, blog, blogspot.fengzudesign.com, I think. I don't even know myself. Uh, I'll link it in the description, right? Uh, but you can download these at 2000K. Um, I put a little logo on the bottom, a little Final Fantasy HD. Um, I hope I don't get in trouble from Square for that because uh, who knows, but if they do, I'll, I'll remove the logo. But uh, I hope not. Um, 
you know, if my friends that are listening, please don't tell the legal department I'm doing it for fun, not making this game for reals. <laughs> this is all for fun, for educational purposes. All right, let's leave it there. So, um, but yeah, guys, go download this. Um, so this episode is coming to our end. We think about, I think we got about maybe another, no, still have another 10 minutes, I think, left on these. Um, so you can see all the blood vessels added in here, um, all these pillars of, uh, of things. Now let's compare it to the original comps. So, um, Let's see, here we go. All right, so here's the original comp on the bottom. And you can see not much change at all. So you can see uh, such an important role that comps played in helping us do the finish. Here's the one for Rocket Town. Comp versus final. Pretty much the same thing. If you shrink the final down, they look exactly the same. And this is the importance of doing comps. Yeah. But I need to stress again, not, you don't need to do comps all the time. This is just one of many, many ways to approach production. If the project calls for it, you can use it, or maybe you're in the mood to use comps, use it, but it is not the, the solution for all. Sometimes you don't want to do comps at all. So anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I think we're uh, almost at the end here. Uh, go ahead and I'll see you guys on Facebook and YouTube. And until then, thank you so much for all your support and I will see you guys next time. All right, guys, bye-bye.